wanted to. Okay, we're, we're going live. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dr. Anya Waite, the Scientific Director and CEO of the Ocean Frontier Institute, and I'd like to welcome you all to our very first Ocean Forum. Please welcome also my co-hosts, OFI's Associate Scientific Director, Paul Snellgrove, and Jim Hanlon, the CEO of COVE, the Center for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship. Thanks very much for helping me set this up and thanks to the OFI team for all their work to date and the assistance at COVE as well. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to our special guests, Kathy Sullivan, aquanaut and astronaut, and Mark Abbott, president and director of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institutions. We will go to slightly more formal introductions in a minute, but I just wanted to give you a little explanation about why we actually started these ocean forum sessions. Here at the Ocean Frontier Institute, our mandate is really to bring researchers and our community and stakeholders together to share our work and particularly to reflect on important developments in ocean research and their impact globally. As most of you know, um, in the recent pandemic, we've really had very few, if, if at any, in-person conversations. Um, and just as a reminder for those of you who were planning to attend, our biannual in-person conference is now postponed until November 2021, for example. And we will be having a virtual conference November 17th and 18th. So in planning for that conference, we wanted to start the conversations early with our stakeholders. And now that everyone's familiar with online platforms, here we are. We thought we would bring thought leaders from all over the world together to really discuss some provocative and timely topics. And today's topic is surfing the ocean data tsunami together, insights from space to the deep sea. So I'll hand it over to Paul Snellgrove for more formal introductions. Thank you, Anya, and hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. As Anya said, astronaut, aquanaut Kathy Sullivan was the first woman to complete a spacewalk in 1984. And just this past spring, she became the first woman to travel 11 kilometers to reach the lowest known point in the ocean. Both support her lifelong passion to understand the world around her. She was also formerly the US Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and the administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. As an added bonus, she's also a Dalhousie graduate. Our second panelist is uh, Mark Abbott, director of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, also known as HUI. Over his 35 year career, Dr. Abbott has led oceanography in new directions through his role as an academic leader and serving on numerous professional committees for federal science funding, scientific societies and laboratories. And he's advised the Office of Naval Research and the National Science Foundation on a whole variety of ocean information infrastructure issues. I'll pass it over now to Jim Hanlon so he can tell us more about why we chose this topic. Jim? Thanks, Paul, and good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, we chose this topic because we produce more data about the ocean than ever before. Scientists are using tools ranging from buoys and water samplers to real-time satellite imagery, autonomous vehicles, and numerous tools. Thanks to the phone apps and technology, even citizens can collect vital information and share it adding more layers to the already crowded data landscape. So how can we keep up? How can we use this wave of data more effectively? Are we managing data or is it beginning to manage us? The future of ocean research will depend on training the next generation of ocean scientists to make sense of this data tsunami in a race against the clock with global warming and other pressures on the ocean. I'm very much looking forward to the presentations and the discussion this morning. Back to you, Anya. Thanks very much, Jim. So just to run through today's format, our guest panelists will have a few minutes each to set the scene on their thoughts on this topic. And Paul, Jim and I will then respond to those, um, ask some questions to begin a bit of a robust debate. Now, you, the audience are very important in this whole process. We would like to include you as far as possible. So please do make comments and do ask questions in the question and answer panel. Um, you can then vote on your favorite questions to try and help them get to the top of the list. And if they're near the top of the list, they'll then um, be eligible to be asked. Uh, we won't guarantee what we get every single question asked, but we'll do our very best. So please vote in your favorites. Please ask your questions. We look forward to hearing from you, the audience. Now, Mark, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Anya. Thanks, Jim and Paul and all of the attendees and to special 
Welcome to my colleague, Kathy. Congratulations on getting to Challenger Deep. That was very, very exciting. So let's see, I am going to share my screen if that all works. Okay. Whoops, we're supposed to get to the beginning slide. We will go to the first one. Okay. So I'm going to talk quickly about my vision of an always on, always connected ocean. And in some sense, you know, the ocean is a harder place to work than outer space uh, because you can't run radio waves through the ocean. So we don't have things that we take for granted on land, GPS, Wi-Fi, uh, et cetera. So what we rely on are going to the sea in ships. Uh, these are the Woods Hole Oceanographic ships down in, on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, and there's, they're really the backbone for exploration and discovery. And what oceanographers have gotten really good at is building fabulous hand-built instruments. So the one there on the left uh, has artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to classify hundreds of individual species of microorganisms. The one on the right, a uh, collaboration between Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and HUI, uh, it's actually a DNA lab in a camp uh, that takes samples, processes them, does all the analytics under the ocean. The great thing about them, they're hand built, they're artisanal. They're almost like something you would get on Etsy. So you don't see very many of them in the ocean and why that is a challenge. So imagine if we wanted to go into a forest every once in a while and study them and you know we can get away with that. But what if those trees in our ocean, it's phytoplankton doubled every day. And not only that, they moved. That means that sort of sparse sampling by those exquisite hand-built instruments makes it really hard for us to really move from an era where our approach to environmental issues is largely sort of detect and repair to how do we move to a predict and prevent. You know, you could think of on the land, the whole self-driving car technology landscape is moving to that, that total awareness of the environment of the driver or where they want to go and sort of integrate that together. We need, I would even argue with Jim, he says we have too much data. We don't have the right type of data and we don't have the capabilities to integrate. It's artisanal in the sense of trying to bring together, cobble together all of these data streams. We need to move to a much more networked approach. And so we could look at the Argo profilers, uh, United States, Canada, Europe, China, lots of nations around the world uh, in the US led by NOAA uh, to deploy. We're really what a revolutionized, re revolutionary system of profilers of the upper ocean to bring that sort of weather forecasting uh, capability. In the US though, we would say, well, that's like having two weather stations in Nebraska. Maybe it's like having three in Saskatchewan. Uh, it's not very much data really. Uh, we really are undersampling the ocean. And Kathy will probably talk about this too. And even in the earth remote sensing, we're beginning to see moving from on the left, the NASA earth observing system. This is the Terra satellite that took 10 years to build a billion dollars to something on the right from a company called Planet Labs based on a CubeSat platform where they launch every three to four months where they can take risks they can innovate more quickly. They're bringing that networked approach rather than a single big bird. They're bringing flocks of capability to the earth remote sensing world. We wanna bring that flexibility, that agility so that you can think of a sensor idea on a Friday, build it on Monday, deploy on Wednesday. Maybe that's a little hyperbole, but we really wanna speed that up. We don't have 10 years to wait. And so what we're starting to see in the ocean is the beginnings of this network, a whole range of technologies, ranging from subsea on the left, a surface a autonomous vehicle to the sail drone on the lower right to a, a so far spotter on the upper right. These are starting to be cheaper instruments, but the more important part is their network. They're connected like our GPS systems, like our Wi-Fi systems, like the systems that support self-driving cars. And so we actually ran a little experiment with some MIT undergraduates last year, 13 of them saying, how could you take that sort of profiler area and rather than just have a, occasional vertical samples, how could you build enough that could sample quickly enough 
were cheap enough to deploy to really understand a volume of the ocean, to really understand harmful algal blooms in the Gulf of Maine and make predictions. The interesting thing was the 13 students here on the left started working in the traditional way in classrooms and labs, then COVID-19 hit, and they did everything the last third of the class via Zoom and remote. The interesting thing about that was not only were they developing new technology, they were developing new ways of working. It was much more democratized and accessible. And in fact, when they gave their presentation to the HUI engineers and scientists last spring, who in the room represented maybe 200 years of experience in underwater sensing and vehicles, and here were 13 kids who between them had six years of experience because they've been working for six months, the HUI engineers walked away, blown away. They said, gee, how can we work with this? I hadn't thought about that problem. So the idea is to not only democratize access to the data, but to bring in the innovation and the people. And lastly, and I'm sorry, I'm still a romantic at heart. It's great to have robots, but there's nothing better than being on the fantail of a ship watching a sunset over an open ocean. So back to you, Anya. Thanks so much, Mark, and uh, a wonderfully thought-provoking talk. Thank you. Let's hope we can follow up with some exciting discussion on that one. Um, now, Kathy, over to you. And uh, what we'll do first is uh, just put a one-minute uh, video of um, some of the activities that you've been involved in over the last little while. Thanks very much, Anya. And uh, you know, Mark and I are you know children brother sister from a different mother on on this topic. Um, my my whole career has been about measuring, monitoring, understanding our planet and how it works uh, from the space vantage point, which of course I got the chance to see personally as an astronaut. Uh, but where that quickly led me uh, was to a desire to get back down to Earth and get into just the game that Mark is alluding to with his presentation. How do we get the necessary comprehensive perspective on all of the systems in, in the Earth system and convert our measurements and our research into actionable information that we all really can use uh, to live wisely and live well on this planet. So Anya, um, I think you're gonna start that video. We'll use that as a bit of a backdrop. What I thought I would do uh, rather than uh, repeat the kinds of things that Mark said, because these are he's teed up brilliantly the sorts of topics we want to explore. I wanted to give you a, a little bit of a sense of the scale of some of the private work that's been done, privately funded work that's been done in the ocean. The deep dive that I was on in early June was uh, funded and, and sponsored by Caliban Oceanic, which is a company created by uh, an equity investor, a well-to-do equity investor by the name of Victor Viscovo. Uh, Victor's, uh, besides being an equity investor and a formal naval, former naval officer, he's quite an adventurer. So he has already in his past uh, summited, reached the summit of each of the seven highest mountains on each continent, uh, skied across, there's Victor here, skied across the North and South Pole. Uh, and he wondered after he had done that, how come there's seven summits, but there's not you know, the seven deeps in, in all the different world's oceans? He started studying that, he learned it's really five deeps in the five major oceans. Uh, and no one had ever developed a craft that could dive to full ocean depth and do it repeatedly and reliably. Uh, and, uh, and, and for that matter, no one even quite knew where the deepest point in all five of the, the major oceans was. This is just the moment that we landed uh, at the Challenger Deep. Uh, so Victor uh, acquired the vessel that he named Pressure Drop, uh, former Navy and NOAA vessel, in fact, and he commissioned Triton submarines to build that little craft that you just saw. And in 2019, uh, he took the vessel and the submarine and completed uh, more than one dive in most cases to the deepest point in each of the five major oceans, the Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, Arctic, and Southern oceans. Uh, it, as part of that effort, he mounted uh, leading edge, cutting edge, state of the art, high resolution multi-beam sonar system on the ship so they could flush in the mapping and confirm the, the depths and the bathymetry where they were diving. So last year was the, the five deeps expedition. This year, the expedition I had a chance to join uh, was the uh, Ring of Fire expedition. Uh, 
but to me, the, the valuable, the personally valuable thing, of course, was the delight of having the firsthand experience of getting to see one of these deep trench environments with my own eyes. But the greater value, and the reason I wanted to talk about this at all, is to give you a sense of the scale of what one rapidly moving visionary entrepreneurial individual has been able to do over a couple of years. In those two expeditions combined, Five Deeps and Ring of Fire, uh, Victor and his team have deployed 164 autonomous landers. These are sort of you know, large packing crate size uh, gadgets, like mainly syntactic foam, but they include high resolution cameras, water sampling bottles, um, baited traps to dry out animals, uh, rock sample, rock collecting boxes uh, for the times that they're working cooperatively with the submarine. Uh, so they've collected uh, thousands, hundreds and hundreds of hours of Hegel zone uh, video uh, and water samples. They've done 31 submersible dives. Uh, you might think back and remember that the first dive to the bottom of the Challenger Deep was by the Trieste in 1960. It was 52 years before the next submersible made it to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. In the month of June, on two expeditions of seven days each at sea, uh, Victor and his team did three submersible dives in the span of seven days, twice back to back. Uh, it's really you know, a, a very different kind of productivity. I'm not arguing that submersibles are uh, any kind of uh, the, the magic tool for the kind of persistent awareness and monitoring that uh, Mark and I are, are, are talking about and believe is so important for the ocean, but they serve a role. I believe they have a place in refining our, our understanding of the ocean. In addition to the divers, the dives and the landers, uh, using the surface ship and the instruments aboard the landers and the sub, they've collected about 1.6 million meters worth of salinity temperature and depth information uh, through the full water column of the deepest parts of the ocean. And just shy of 1 million square kilometers of high re resolution bathymetric data. Uh, the, historically, the resolution of our deep sea bathymetry has been about a factor of 10 worse than our knowledge of topography of Mars or the moon. Uh, Victor's effort is driving that down quite considerably and they're getting down to single, plus or minus single digit meter accuracy at, at full ocean depths. So many, many tools coming to bear and that's the right thing to do. How do we overcome the physics of the ocean so that we can richly net network sensors together? so that we can get swarms operating cooperatively together, moored instruments, bottom instruments, sail drones. Uh, and so they can operate uh, intelligently together and respond, for example, to detections of, of certain biologics or detections of variations in currents. Uh, that's one of the great challenges, very much great challenges ahead. I, I just wanna make one point about uh, small sats uh, and the cube sats that Mark showed actually two points that come to mind that remind us that whenever great new prospects come along, they bring with them new challenges as well. So the CubeSat arena, uh, one, of the, one of those challenges is uh, one man's CubeSat swarm is another man's debris cloud when it comes to space. Uh, and some of these very large constellations of small sats are becoming an obstacle to cutting edge astronomy. So we're also going to need socially and politically to find ways to have the right conversations together about what needs are we pursuing, what objectives are we pursuing, and what compromises or consequences, what spillover consequences are, to are tolerable to allow these different advances. Uh, another parallel in the sea and the space arena is, is the advent of private sector funders and players uh, taking on roles that through through the lifetimes of everybody uh, speaking on this call have been public purpose roles. Uh, in my own view, that's not intrinsically bad, uh, but again, it raises, it, it adds seams, it raises questions about intellectual property. Uh, it brings different dynamics about access to data, uh, the data that governments have collected, uh, funded by their taxpayers have historically been made available at, at free and open access uh, to, Stick, dip your spoon in that data soup and pick out as much as you need. Uh, but now some of the uh, players coming into the space arena, in particular Planet Labs that Mark mentioned is, is an example, uh, they're privately funding those swarms of satellites and they therefore intend to monetize the data. They're gonna sell the ones and zeros. 
not uh, not sell uh, a value added information product as a service to users, but actually sell the raw ones and zeros. What will the implications of that be for research access, for educational access, and for equitable access by communities that that don't have the means uh, to pay for some high subscription service? Back to Victor Riscovo for one final point. Uh, All of the scientific uh, data that I just quickly recapped that he's collected over 2019 and 2020, uh, that work is being, the scientific work is being shepherded by Dr. Alan Jameson uh, out of University of Newcastle uh, in association with other researchers from many institutions around the world. And all of it is going into public domain scientific databases to be freely available for everyone to use. So Anya, um, let me leave it there because I think we all want to get into a conversation and uh, begin engaging with the audience online. Great, thanks so much, Kathy. Another really thought provoking set of comments and it's a bit hard to know where to start, but I think what, where we might start is there's been a number of questions coming through the chat um, through the question and answer bar. And a number of them are around what are the new skills that are really needed to bring society to the level where we can take advantage of this data set. And I, I'd like to ask you two questions around that. First of all, just the plain question, what, how do we need to train our next generation to um, to get the most out of this environment. And second of all, you know, one of the things I really heard from your um, talk, Kathy, particularly is you are, have done a deep dive as an individual investigator, observing with your eyes. And surely the individual is the ultimate artisanal instrument. So how are artisanal instruments and individuals, what is their role in the new data rich environment? Well, I'll pick up where Mark closed his remarks. Uh, you know, nothing beats a glorious sunset from the fantail or the housetop of a ship at sea. Uh, and as Don Walsh, the pilot of Trieste back in the 1960 dive to Challenger Deep, uh, as Don is fond of capturing this point, he says, no one wants to grow up to be a robot. Uh, you know, we, we are, humans are born explorers. Exploring is the fundamental mode by which we develop as infants and progress through childhood into adulthood. Uh, there, and I, it varies with person to person, but uh, my take is if you absolutely know the data you need to get, uh, then surely our electronics and computing uh, systems are powerful enough. You can design a system that will do precisely what you told it to do. Uh, but we're uh, still a far ways away from where that system might recognize something you didn't know to tell it to look for and be and respond to that in, in an inquisitive way as a human can do. Uh, and even as a, certainly my own experience, I, I find I'm convinced my own scientific uh, pursuits have been enriched by the fact that I had the firsthand experience out in the field as a young geologist, out at sea as a young oceanographer, um, in orbit looking back at the earth. Uh, And my simple sanity test is, if you don't think the direct personal experience matters, tell me, tell me that you're not going to mind missing your daughter's wedding as long as you get to see the pictures. Thanks, an excellent point. Mark, did you have a comment on that, particularly on the new skills required to deal with this tsunami of data? Sure. I think that there are certainly, the, we'll call them, for lack of a better term, the harder skills. I think sort of a computational way of thinking, thinking about data, thinking about statistics, how they work together. I think that sometimes is gets lost in the era of increasing specialization among our graduate and undergraduate students. So a comfortableness, a facility, a facileness of being able to work with large data and look for those sort of unexpected connections. I mean, that's that's a that takes time, and and we don't provide a lot of opportunities for students to go in and work with that and collaborate. And that leads into the the, the softer skills, which is an ability to listen <laughs> and an ability to work and understand different ways of thinking in different cultures. And it's not just between the social science and the natural science, even within the natural science. Sometimes it's hard for physicists to talk to biologists and vice versa. And really being able to, you know, think back to my career, the the fact that I had enough physics to be dangerous, but I was an ecologist, meant the physical oceanographers couldn't pull the wool over my eyes. And they knew that. 
And that opens up a lot of doors. So it's not that everybody has to be an expert in everything, but you have to be able to understand their culture, their values, and be able to listen and figure, go into every situation figuring you can learn. That often isn't the case when the, in the era of experts, sometimes, you know, I know what to do, just go do it. And that's when, you know, we think about that shift of being able to, not that there isn't truth out there, not that there aren't better ways to do things, but it's an ability to listen and recognize there are gaps in your own knowledge and an ability to learn is just endless. You've got to have that. Yeah, Anya, if I could jump in on that. Um, I, I agree with what Mark said, but I would also add, there's part of this is going to have to involve change uh, in the institutions and in some of the cultures and modes of education, because the, the kind of approach Mark is talking to, about, which I resonate with completely, uh, that, is, that is much more of a collaborative than a competitive uh, kind of a culture. And you, you will encounter in a number of places the mindset that collaborative means soft, uncompetitive, unexcellent. It, it, it's collaborative means weak and it's a sacrifice uh, of excellence. It's a lowering of standards. Uh, my experience certainly teaches me, and I know Mark is the same, that's exactly wrong. It's, it's exactly the opposite. You're not sacrificing excellence by an ability to listen to other people. Uh, but we've got to get around that some and be willing to allow students and classes uh, time to do this exploration and time to do this, this different, uh, learning these different skills. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, thanks for those comments. I guess I was going to reach out to Jim now because one of the things that you're both saying is we need, in order to move forward technologically and in terms of our data advancement, we really need to be working in new ways in transdisciplinary and collaborative ways. And of course, uh, the COVE, the Center for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship is exactly a place that is trying to um, bring that sort of discussion to bear. So Jim, I wonder if you could comment on how the work you're doing um, at COVE, for example, is, is really speaking to those new sorts of values. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, sure. I'm, I guess my perspective is that of a, an engineer that spent his 40 year career working with ocean scientists. So I'm not a scientist, I'm an engineer and a business person, first and foremost. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, COVE's purpose is all about this interface between the needs, wants of ocean science, the innovation of ocean science, and, and the commercial world. And, and I think it's a very symbiotic, two-way positive relationship if it's managed correctly. So um, just to be a bit provocative, I guess um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the emergence of the philanthropy uh, investment in ocean science. I think that's really cool. I agree with what Kathy said. There's some perils around it. But on the other hand, it sure brings a lot too. And, and you know, anything I would know about the commercial world says, it's anything but soft and weak. It's very purpose-driven. It's very efficiency-driven. It's very bottom-line-driven, and only those that succeed in delivering survive. And so I think you know there's a health about bringing that that uh, that source of revenue and expertise and innovation to the market as well. I'm going to launch a question in response to that, though, which is that we haven't talked yet about the common person citizen science opportunity. And and I I'm fascinated by what's going on in the world of meteorology around. IBM's Weather Underground and the Weather Channel, the Weather Network on the one hand, and things like um, crowdsourced bathymetry coming out of JEBCO and the International Hydrographic Office and Seabed 2030. Could either of you folks um, comment on the role of the average human in, in, in ocean science? You know, when it comes to weather forecasting, the average bear has been a critical factor, uh, certainly in the United States, from the inception of weather services. Uh, there, there, there wasn't the instrumentation. You relied on telegraph operators and railroad station chiefs out along the lines. And NOAA nowadays even has something like 11 or 12,000 uh, volunteer observers. Now, what they do is make sure that those observers know how to calibrate and maintain the instruments they put in their backyard or out of their school so that you're, you're training them to help control the reliability and to care about the quality of the data that they're submitting because the data are going to go into the forecast models that that real people are going to rely on to make real decisions so you you know you build no has worked hard over the years to build in that that compact with their observers uh, that this is not just measure what you want doesn't matter how good or bad it is send it in hooray you participated this is really joining an enterprise that people are going to rely on and count on and so that's a, a two-way obligation um, 
I'm less familiar with the bathymetry side. Mark can probably speak to that, but it's uh, you know volunteer observations and and private sector sources of ground-based weather data are integral to the forecast op operation nowadays. Yeah, I'll just chime in on that. The ocean's always going to be a hard place to get to, so for, you know it's the volunteer weather observing network. You can put up a, a meteorological class right. weather station. You know, got a couple of thousand U.S. dollars, you can put one in, get it on the network. A little harder to go to sea. However, if the data are available, if there are standard interfaces that you have to communicate through, basically, you know, Jeff Bezos wrote this for Amazon ten years ago that. Everything has to communicate through an interface, no back doors. I don't care what technology you use. It has to be, anybody be, has to be able to go and add to it. That's what the astronomy community is doing with a lot of their large scale surveys. Uh, citizen science has discovered a whole class of galaxies. There was a school teacher, yeah. I think it was Denmark or Netherlands that discovered a class of galaxies that astronomers didn't know because uh, this person was just going through the archives finding those connections, if the data is out there and it's net workable, that's where the citizen science and ocean science can really come together. Uh, but I would add also probably in, in coastal zones. I mean, for blue water oceanography, the, the deep sea basin scale stuff, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but I think there's an, a, another class of opportunities in and around coastal zones and coastal communities uh, that, that could be very rich in part because the density, the biological density there is, is high in most places. So even more sampling and repeat visits is very valuable. Yeah, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, when we're talking about the private-public partnership, um, how do we get across the barriers to data sharing in that context when you have one sector of the observers really wanting to monetize and the other sector um, focused on taxpayers' money and public good. You know, what's, what's the balance there and, and how do we bring those two different types of players together? That's a great question, Anya. This, you know, we tend to rely on the government and the government's done a great job on that. But I think the fact of the matter is they're all, as I've noticed some of the Q&A, what are the big global ocean databases? There are a lot out there. UN has done them. The, the sort of seafaring yeah. agencies of the various governments have done them. It's, it's still very hard to go in and add new stuff. Uh, they're designed to meet specific needs. And when you look at networks, that's a, sorry to put it in sort of geek speak, but if you really think about the interface so that people can add new capabilities more easily, it's really redesigned, not just say, well, it's, if I just cobble these together, I can solve it. That's true. You can, you can cobble together to solve one type of problem, but you don't know what the problems are going to be or what the data sets are, that are going to be available or the kind of questions you want to ask. We really need to think differently about how we integrate those together and make them basically more scalable so that it's not only that I can add more, I can add new types, I can derive new kinds of services. You know, I think about Vince Cerf who did invent the internet a long, long time ago. And he tells a tale about he was, he and a small team came up with what's called TCP IP, the interface that allowed packets to move across a network. And he said, we just wanted to make it open and scalable so we could move email from different computers. We had no idea that it was going to be at the core of how self-driving cars were going to work or social networking or all of the things that have grown around that. He could not have foreseen that. And so it's building that open interface, enabling anybody to come in and plug in. That's what we've got to get to. Yeah, that's a it's a very it's a very interesting and broad question. I wonder if we could take on. There's one question in the chat um, from Marlon Lewis, and he's you know asking about the balance between many very cheap sensors and one or two specialized high resolution sensors. And there's it's a little bit of a you know in the, in the same way we have the question of of citizen science. You know, many small observations between. Um, against one or two really big ones. And what's the way to balance that across, um, you know, the current needs for data? 
I'll take that on from my good friend Marlon and a totally <laughs> expected question from Dr. Absolutely. Lewis. Absolutely. <laughs> you but knew that one was coming. <laughs> you knew. My sense is that the exquisite instruments like the ones I showed really are the, the groundbreaking, the pointy end of the sphere that really move the technology and the capability forward. But they need to be done with a vision of now, how do I scale that? How do I scale that up? Because ultimately, if I want to make a prediction of harmful algal blooms and I've got two sensors in the Gulf of Maine, my error is going to be dominated by the sampling errors. I undersample everything. I don't sample enough density in space or enough in time. And that's where cheaper, lower quality sensors, you know, within reason, really enable that. And the Weather Service has really shown that, that a, a few great stations let you test new ideas. You know, when we went to acoustic you know, sonic anemometers as opposed to cup spinning. Right. Eventually that price gets driven down and anybody can buy those things. And, you know, it improves that quality. So the exquisite really moves that forward. But in the end of the day, I need more. And that's that's where we're going to be. I know, Kathy, you want to chime in. Yeah, I, the only point I would add to that is uh, I, I do think there's a bit of a taxonomy in the observing system. Uh, and it would depend you have to discover this and evolve it as you, as the problems that you're tackling change over time. But there is also a place for the, if not exquisite in the artisanal handcrafted sense, then certainly exquisite in the resolution and reliability and stability sense to anchor and help control the error budgets as you get these distributed networks of sensors. Uh, that's uh, the, the, the key to how Victor Vescovo is trying to drive down the error budget on measuring deep ocean bathymetry is that multiple sensors calibrated and, and periodically co-located. So each submersible dive, he would put three landers on the bottom with um, CTD instruments and depthometers on each one and a couple of those instruments on the sub and consciously purposely tie them together over the course of a transect so you could you know, drive the errors down. And what that does is increase the value of every measurement mm -hmm. in the set. So yeah. uh, you, you've got to find, figure out a way to get there. But the other point we're sort of skirting around here is uh, something Noah certainly deals with. I know Mark's dealing with it at Woods Hole. Um, the, what we have today in the data systems, both the data storage and archive systems and the data capture and handling systems of today uh, are all very personalized. They're, you know, maybe they're sort of an institutional level architecture that bridges across some of the Woods Hole groups, but more likely it's each group each group creates its data standard, its approach for that instrument that they built based on their past knowledge. They're not following the Vint Cerf or the Jeff Bezos model. And so, you know, I liken this to opening the worlds. It's the Indiana Jones problem, right? You've got all these little cartons of data that each investigator team created back when on storage shelves that you can't begin to tackle. So how do we, you know, to, to what degree is it valuable to try to update and integrate that archival data? That's the time series of the past that is, is always very helpful to understanding climate and trend in our natural systems. But that's, it's timely, it's time consuming, it's laborious, it's very unsexy stuff to spend money on. So it tends to not be supported uh, by public funds. Uh, so you're either going to walk away from that archive and that time history of data and just start being Jeff Bezos tomorrow with some architecture that gives us a, a future capability. That's a very thorny problem that mostly everybody ducks. Yeah, definitely. I can, um, I can, I like the way you frame that question. I think there's a, I can, I'm just noticing that there's a lot of questions coming through in the question Q and A, and I'd really like to get to a few of those. They've, they're getting quite a few votes. Um, before we do that, I'd just like to have one question that perhaps um, Paul uh, Snellgrove can, can help us with, and that is, what is, how can we serve the other big ocean agenda, which is ocean conservation, using these new data streams? I don't know if, Paul, if you want to comment a little bit on some of the needs and challenges. Well, I'll just say something to get us started and then pass it over to our panelists. But um, certainly information is critical in coming up with effective conservation strategies and our capacity to sample the ocean 
more effectively than we have in the past, I think is really critical to success. So I think this ties in very well with this whole discussion on data and sensors. Um, maybe I'll frame this initially for Mark. I think biology has lagged significantly behind the other disciplines in developing sensors uh, for uh, ocean life. And so when we think about conservation type questions, this really becomes limiting. So a any thoughts on that, Mark? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I always like to say physics is easy, ecology is hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, having been in this world for a long, long time, and we look particularly under the ocean, I mean, you've got optics and acoustics and, you know, that you're really looking for those signals and you know acoustics is okay but not everything has a good acoustical signature optics doesn't go very far in terms of distance so it's uh, a little tough i think you're you're right in that it's it not only is it the the sensing the signal that you'd measure are few but the diversity is enormous i mean i showed you that uh, what's called the in situ flow cytobot the thing that uh, identifies hundreds of microorganisms. I mean, the variety is just huge. I think it though, it, what the ecological community is starting to move towards is rather than say, let's just recreate the, the physics types models where, you know, I take Newton's equations and I extend them and I've got all of these things. It's much more of a, what we'll call stochastic or probabilistic in that you really want to understand the rules that move one ecosystem type, you know, a, a diatom based phytoplankton ecosystem to one that's dominated by dinoflagellates and harmful algal blooms. What, what are the rules in the environment or in the internal structure that make one system move from one state to another? You know, it's, and because for a manager or a conservationist, you're really interested in harmful algal blooms. You don't necessarily need to know all of the details and understand how it makes that transition. You want to know what causes it to move from one area to another. It really starts to change ecological models, which right now are really based on uh, chemical engineering models. They're just sort of reaction diffusion equations to thinking differently about that. And I think that that's where the citizen science to tie a little bit into what Kathy mentioned earlier. Uh, a lot of the ecosystem questions are near shore. There's a lot of work being done on coral reefs and on fisheries where, you know, we can begin to collect those data sets, but you know, it's a tough problem, Paul. There's no easy answer on that one. So, so good indicators and proxies perhaps is another yep. way of stating that. Yep. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kathy, anything you wanted to add to that or shall we move on to the next one? No, I, I think that's spot on. You've got to find a way scientifically sound, logically sound way to get past having to solve the problem of gazillion eaches. You can't, you can't solve the gazillion eaches problem in the ocean. Yeah. yeah. If I could just chime in one other thought on this. If you look at the whole field of artificial intelligence and yeah. natural speech for 50 years, people were working through you know, trying to come up with all the equation, basically an equation approach. Yeah a very rigorous, it's great. They moved a lot. They learned a lot about how language works and how you translate. Why has it gotten so good in the last 10 years? It's big data. It's artificial intelligence and machine learning, deep learning based on lots of data types. And all of a sudden, if you look, the error rates have gone from in the sort of 20, 25% down into the 5%. It just went off a cliff. And up or well, or I guess better way to say it, the performance went so that it, now you can get it in your iPhone or whatever. Yeah, that was driven by data and stochastic approaches as opposed to predictive dynamic. Yeah, excellent. And I just interject a comment. I think the big data problem is you you kind of debated with me at the beginning, Mark, and I would tend to agree with your point, which is ocean data is not that big. It, it's disparate. It's disconnected. It's you know here, there, and everywhere but speech recognition came out of the fact that it was readily available in large volume to those algorithm developers. And we suffer from that in the ocean side. It's just That's not right. all available. Now it's, it's in those shoe boxes on the closet shelf yeah. tucked away and everything's in a different format. Right. And so I think um, one of the next issues we need to discuss um, after we go to a couple of questions is 
um, how do we get things out of the shoebox and what are the technologies and infrastructures we need to build uh, nationally and internationally. But before we do that, let's just talk a uh, touch base on some of the questions here. Christine Ward Page has a question. Um, and really it's about the social impact of big data. How do we make sure in this new data rich environment that no one gets left behind? And particularly in Canada, um, we're concerned about First Nations and indigenous people specifically and other minority groups. Um, how do we pull all of society together um, around these challenges and not leave pockets of data poor uh, communities behind? Yeah, yeah that's partly a financial and partly a, or partly an investment and partly a social question, it, it seems to me. We made some small steps uh, along similar issues during my tenure at NOAA. And on the social side, the thing I was surprised at how hard and persistently I had to hammer on this, uh, but it was, this was just the simple version of that of let's get social scientists and social science insights more directly uh, woven into our weather forecast enterprise. And just to get the core weather guys, the mainly physics and meteorology guys, just to get them to understand that that had to mean social science were at the table with you from the very start of the very first conversation about what you were gonna do. They were not invited you know, four meetings in when you'd kind of already laid out a roadmap and now you're sort of come on along and put your fingerprints on it or tweak it a little bit or, or better yet, just endorse it and tell me I was nice and, and then go away. Um, so genuinely a shared conversation from square one about what is the pursuit? What are the issues we're trying to solve? What are the ways of approaching it? Uh, and again, that takes more, you know, that takes more time because that's time to learn each other's vocabulary. That's time to gain some uh, sympathy and understanding of each other's frames of reference and sense of what's important. And uh, we tend to live in very impatient societies uh, where we want, we've been granted some money, the, the funder wants results right away, not several weeks or a couple of months of getting a social team built. And then the secondly, second thing, of course, uh, is it will take investment to ensure that uh, those communities in their community have the tools and the means uh, to make the, the data and the information accessible to them where they live, not after a trip to Washington, D.C., or if they hike on down to Toronto. Right, and it's perhaps those low-cost sensors, which are then um, deployable in a number of different ways, including supporting citizen science and uh, the ability of small communities to do observations in their own backyard. Yeah. Any other comments, Mark, Jim, or Paul, on that one before we go to the next question? I think Kathy really laid out that it's it's a tough problem. <laughs> we always like to say things are a smock, a small matter of cash, <laughs> but you know there's actually a cultural reward. It's got to be a value. You have to be intentional and, and say we're just going to make this work. Could I, again, just to speaking on behalf of the commercial world, you know the behavior of some of these ultra high net worth individuals fascinates me. There's no question these are. Um, there are commercial interests at play in, in, in some of this, but there's also a true altruism, you know, that, that spirit of innovation to discovery of, you know, really excellent people who have been very successful can bring back um, value to this in, in a very democratic, very equality driven model. So I, you know, don't discount the value of the Jeff Bezos, the, the you know, the, those kinds of people I think are important in this, in this equation. I think that I think they're making some real contributions in the ocean arena. There's there are differences in style and manner and method amongst them, of course. I mean, uh, Viscovo is has mounted a scientific uh, enterprise. He's paying for it out of his own pocket, and he's very much letting the scientists drive uh, a lot of where you go and what you measure and put the data back in scientists' hands. Others are you know, there's a little bit of I I'm the curious guy that owns this expedition yacht, and I want to go here. Uh, and why don't I bring a scientist along to add a little science to it? That might not be, it might not be the place or the kind of measurement the scientist would have recommended as the most valuable thing to do, but it's, uh, it's the only one I'm going to let you do if you want to come along on my ship. So, so, you know, how do you, and that's another one of those, how do we get that seem sort of as however effective, productive that it can, uh, can, you know, it's just, it's not working great in all cases. I think everyone's happy to have whatever bits of data they can get from those 
vessels of opportunity. Uh, but I can't help but wish that some of those folks were a little more, uh, they're, doing, they're doing another version of, this is what I've decided to measure and you can come along, which is what the conventional science community is often accused of doing around uh, indigenous communities. I'm here and I'm the scientist and I have the, the tool, so I'm gonna measure it. I'll leave you some data if you want, but it might not be the thing that matters most to you. It might not be the information of greatest value to you. Uh, and it probably ignored uh, any input from you about what you already knew and understood. So it still comes back to, you know, I think what Mark said earlier, listen to each other and really uh, come together with some commitment to mutual appreciation and mutual good. Is there a role for governments to provide fiscal incentives around tax relief for data philanthropy? Uh, that's a thorny one. <laughs> It has come up in other venues. I mean, this whole idea of incentivizing that behavior by making that donation of data, not equipment, um, tax deductible. Interesting. Yeah, and I think this brings up the, a, a whole a whole broader set of issues around perhaps scientists' worst fears around citizen science generally, not just citizen science done by citizens who are high net worth and therefore have an enormous amount of power. Um, but how do you manage quality control where the, the data floodgates are open and we're trying to pull every single citizen on board? How do we, what is the role of the scientists then um, in trying to, you know, usually we're not great communicators, um, we're not even great communicators across disciplines in natural sciences, let alone across the social sciences or with the public. How do we, how do we make sure that somehow the scientific process, which is somehow something we all rest on, you know, that's the heft that brings the, 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 the data rich hypothesis testing dry part of science, which is as we believe these are true data, um, you know, f facts and figures that we can, we can rest on and rely on. Wh what becomes of that in the citizen science rich, high net worth individual rich environment um, where data is coming from everywhere? Wow, okay, that's an easy question. <laughs> You know, I think this gets me into trouble, maybe. But, you know, look, at least down here, I don't know how Canada's public health, the equivalent of CDC handled it. But if you look at the, quote, models down here in the U.S., and we'll click on the University of Washington, which was one of the most publicly available forecast models. Wow, nobody talks about how bad a lot of the predictions were. I mean, they, it was tough. And so was it a data quality problem? Was it a modeling problem? I think the fact of the matter is, you, it's this is not casting aspersions on them. It's really saying, come in and acknowledge the gaps, acknowledge the uncertainties that you have and that we can all learn from each other on this. You know, it, I look at the weather forecast from uh, Kathy's former employer, you know, we get probabilities, you know, there's a 40% chance of rain today. Well, what is, I really, as a, if I'm planning something for tomorrow, if they say it's a 50%, I'd like to know the, kind of the uncertainty. It, it doesn't have to be necessarily quantitative, but at least qualitative. Where are our gaps? That's why I say, if you come in acknowledging that there are gaps in your knowledge and that you can learn and that there is no perfect data out there. That really helps. And as far as the ocean, one of the things, uh, the, the whole reinsurance industry, the big, in, you know, the multinationals, the Axes and the Swiss Re's and Munich Re's that insure the insurance companies are really interested in understanding the ocean and, and insuring a lot of the risks. They say they need two things. They need to know what are the probabilities of bad events happening, a harmful algal bloom or a severe storm or whatever. But they also need another key element What's your uncertainty around that? Because then I can begin to make a market around it. But if you just say it's a 40% chance, but you know, it's plus or minus you know, 80%, it's might as well play lottery. The other thing, and I know this maybe is not the focus of this group, but when you talk to people in running US submarines, Navy, they wanna know not only if you're giving them a prediction, the guys and gals on the bridge, the command center of that sub say, and tell me your uncertainty around that, because that helps me make a decision. Yep. It's that uncertainty 
that we need to bring to the table. And whether it's quote perfect data or not, there's still uncertainty in it. This was Marlon Lewis's earlier question. We still undersample. So what are the errors around that? You know, so it's there's a level, it's not just honesty, it's a recognition. And there's a value in that because if you're uncertain, that helps guide you on where you need, what you need to do and measure to lower those uncertainties. Where the investments need to go. Exactly. Hey, uh, you know, one other point comes to mind on this subject. A uh, number of years ago when I was at NOAA, I spent a good long day uh, at IBM in their Watson group, their, their artificial intelligence group. And, you know, Watson at that time was particularly, they were, their developments were particularly focused on the healthcare side of things and specifically on how to help um, oncologists deal with matching proper clinical trials uh, to pa specific patients. Uh, and what we wondered about this problem, you know, so you're gonna make, you're gonna make really meaningful and important recommendations to this doctor out of the AI system. How do you, you know, how do you deal with the reliability of the data you get in on the front end so that you know what you've got? And their answer really surprised me. Their answer was, we don't. We take the data in from everywhere we can get it in vast quantities. Uh, and what they had discovered was uh, in, in the case of Watson, their machine learning algorithm was, was now skilled enough that it quickly learned. You, you put this amount of weight on the results from Mass General Hospital because they're, it's, the machine has learned there's a proven reliability, there's a good batting average from that source. And you put less weight on this other source because over many, 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 many computational cycles, uh, the, the proven weight of that has shown, been shown statistically in the calculations to be lower. So, you know, Watson learned which measurers, which data sets were better and more reliable than others. And it began to weight its decisions accordingly. So I, I Again, we're, we're not in that kind of data volume situation with the ocean or, or really anything in earth system science. But I think that that ought to be the way we try to move, I think, with respect to citizen science. It's not saying you relieve the individuals who want to submit data from any obligation to take some care in the data that they submit. And it's not to say you can't, uh, that you can afford to completely ignore uh, the prospect of someone deliberately spoofing or polluting the data set. So you've got to do need to think about some front end um, approaches to, to deal with that. But if we could get to something akin to the public health, uh, the cancer screening, the clinical trials world, uh, there, there's a pathway potentially to solve that by the machine learning. Thanks, Kathy. I'll just, we're, we're coming up on an hour and I don't wanna to run too much over, but there are a few questions in the um, Q and A that I'd like to touch on and one or two other minor questions that have come up that I'd like to um, raise with you. So um, one is around, um, you know, data volume in the ocean being potentially a bit smaller than in some other areas in terms of big data sets. But now that we're going into ocean genetics, that's a completely different scale. And now it's actually, the ocean genetics is potentially bigger than any other global genetics data set. So just if you wanted to comment on that before we go to the, to the q and yes. I'll defer to Mark on that one. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes, it's potentially big. Again, I think there is a revolution coming in the kind of sensor technology so that this what's called eDNA, environmental DNA, is going to really, it, the sensor and the processing cost is just gonna drop precipitously, it already has. I mean, genomic sequencing, you know, you buy a sequencer and you get a cloud-based service and it's just, you know, it used to be a hand done, a very expensive process, now it's done in volume. So I think that's another, that's a great opportunity, but if we need to start thinking about how do we bring that together so it doesn't just become, it's not just a pipeline that, I bring this in and I can answer that question. That's what, you know, in the oceanography world and a lot of the science community, we collect data to answer a question. <laughs> and so we pull that all together and we cobble that. And then it goes into the shoe boxes or the closets or the trailers. If we start thinking much more that this is part of a network of knowledge and intelligence, and I, you know, it's the Bezos memo, that then enables that to become 
repurposed to address other kinds of questions. So we really have to, thinking of the volume, it's, it's not the size of the disk drives anymore. It's how do I make that accessible? What's the interface to get into that data? That's yeah. where we need to put the money. You're, you're so right, Mark. And one of the, one, a good, great example of that is um, the new uses for 16S um, sequence data, which is now allowing a broad scale look for function um, of microbes as opposed to just present absence of different microbes. And that is now going to absolutely blast through an understanding of the, of, uh, the biological oceanography. Right. Yeah. Um, we have we have a couple of questions I'd like to go to, and um, I was wondering maybe Paul, you can also comment on this. So Yui Cheng asked a question: What is your vision on international collaboration in ocean research, and what are the current challenges? I wonder if Paul, you could speak um, a bit to that first. Yeah, I mean, certainly as somebody living in Canada, uh, I have many colleagues in the United States. And trying to set up a collaboration is really complicated. And that's Canada and the US who are really very friendly nations who have a lot in common, common language, common culture. Uh, and yet uh, to share a research cruise is really difficult. And so when we start thinking about other nations with, yeah. with less in common, the, the problem becomes even greater. And so um, I think certainly there's a tremendous amount to be gained by trying to overcome this problem. And maybe I'll throw this one at Kathy. We think of the International Space Station as one, uh, one approach, and certainly Huey ships have taken out scientists from around the world. Right. But, but how do we get past all of this? Yeah, it's, it, it wasn't easy in the space arena uh, to get it started, and it's not even easy to sustain it, of course. But uh, I think a key difference there is pretty well every country that has a national space agency has a fairly clear understanding that the, in addition to putting things in space and bringing space services back to earth, uh, a pretty clear understanding that the space agency is a, plays a fundamental role in their diplomacy and outreach. So it's, it, they're consciously thinking of their space agencies as agents of international relations uh, and international connection. Uh, that smooths some of the way, it, it sort of sets some permissions and puts some wind in your sails, if you will, uh, but the but the mechanics and the rules and the, the regulations and strictures are still very very cumbersome. Um, so I don't have an easy answer for the the ocean arena. I think it's it, unfortunately more bottoms up institution to institution than some overarching vision. I know in in the states uh, down in the Obama administration that there, there was a an effort to try to change that through some use of special envoys to the State Department and a couple of positions in the White House that were intended to help bridge and catalyze uh, and add some high level political leverage to the making of those connections. Um, but those tended to become, uh, in many cases, those tended to become sort of ceremonial and figurative connections mm -hmm. that didn't really translate into meaningful change down at the institutional or ship level cooperation. Uh, Mark, you, you sit right in the middle of this at Hui with a lot of your commitments too, so chime in. Sure, that's a great, great question. I would argue sometimes it's easier to do the international collaborations than to get US <laughs> federal agencies to collaborate. <laughs> as now, now, now. Know, <laughs> as, as we all know. Um, We've had this you know, one. You know, it, I think, you know, Kathy touched on a lot of them. It's, you know, I'm involved on the national, US National Academy of Sciences, the Ocean Studies Board, and we're the US Committee for the UN Decade of Science for sustainable development that's just has been a little bit uh, delayed because of COVID-19, but it's underway. You know, I think the UN programs are one venue to get these international collaborations. My concern is it's a decade and yet we're talking about a persistence. Um, I think you find that the bilateral or multilateral arrangements work real well. It's clear more and more nations of the world are interested in their EEZs and that's fine. But it's the big open, it's the blue ocean that it does, where it right. doesn't belong to anybody. You know, the, the whole issue of deep sea mining mm -hmm. is a real challenge. And how do I, you know, th this goes way beyond my pay grade. It's one of the hardest issues to recognize individual nations have interests, and so does the world, including the non seafaring nations have interest in what goes on in the ocean. And it's, it's just a hard, hard problem. It's just constantly, there's no easy, easy solution. 
So I'd just like to follow on with that. Um, we have two other questions, one from Jeff LeBoutlier and one from Margaret Ray, and they both deal with science supporting public interest versus private interest versus interest in general. So Jeff LeBoutlier said, I don't mean to demean any alt altruistic pursuits, but science supporting drilling on the Scotian shelf or expanding open net pens in Nova Scotia coastal bays can clearly be problematic. Um, and Margaret Ray said um, she feels it's critically critical to get the public excited about the ocean, particularly now with the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So how can we take all these data sets and turn them into products that the public can really engage with, see and follow? Um, and do we need public spaces um, for innovation, innovative transformation activities um, to ensure that this happens? See, they keep asking us easy questions, Mark. Um, by the way, hello to Jeff, a uh, longtime friend. Um, let me touch a little bit on the public side of things because it, it gets to another, uh, another problem I think we have with, with our institutions. Uh, one of our best armies for doing that ought to be the scientists who are so passionate uh, about the ocean and about understanding it. And in particular, uh, young folks who are drawn ocean studies as the start of their career pathway are just you know usually brimming with passion uh, and yet the academic incentives uh, mitigate very strongly against investing any of your time in engaging with the public i mean young faculty at, in institutions in the states uh, are commonly told you know don't do anything except grind away and publish for seven years until you're solidly set for tenure uh, you know even even a a little bit of time doing silly stuff like engaging the public uh, will detract from your prospects of getting tenure. So it, that, that just says so many things to me about uh, the ivory tower mindset, uh, about uh, feeling that any communication with, a pub, with people that don't speak precisely your scientific vocabulary amounts to dumbing down as opposed to as actually just communicating with uh, an audience that is not identical to you. Uh, and I, you know, I've beat my head against that wall a number of times. I know Mark has as well. It's just very, very hard to do, but it's exactly in the early professorial years that I would want people out uh, doing that. They're closer in age to the school kids they might uh, engage with. They're closer contemporaries to the, the teachers in those classrooms whose appreciation of the science and facility with it, they might uh, increase tremendously. Um, it's just, it's it is absolutely magic to give a middle school or high school teacher a real scientific research experience where they feel they have been accepted as a co-colleague and are respected by a genuine scientist. That teacher goes back to the classroom with so much more confidence in their ability to represent and explain science to the students in their class, and it's absolutely transformative. And so, why are we making it so impossible for young faculty to do that? Thanks, Kathy. Mark, did you have any comment on that one? Yeah, you know, that's a, it's a really, it's a tough issue. And Kathy just laid out a lot of them. And it's one of the things, it kind of goes back to the question about can science supporting drilling or mining or what have you. You know, a lot of the ocean science community and Woods Hole Oceanographic did this as well too. Is that, you know, we do science to inform the public. We inform decision makers. You know, we tell people, you know, here's what we think, you know, you go do. I would like to change that subtly, but I think it's important. We want to help people make better decisions. Yeah. And that is in stewardship. That means, you know, if you have, is seabed mining better for the overall environment or worse? And how, how do we make that a better decision? To me, a better decision means it's open. It means it's dynamic and adaptive. You know, we learn. Uh, we don't do things that are irreversible, but we recognize that there are some decisions that are that are a trade-off. It engages by saying better rather than inform. It engages the science community to really think about what are the important questions people need, not just what we think is important and what we think is interesting. You know, I still remember being at a meeting of 400 atmospheric scientists and a city climate person saying, you know, I really need to know the next decade freeze thaw cycles. And, you know, why aren't you studying that? And the scientists said, because I can't get published. 
But she said, I need to know that because I've got maps of the paving of all the streets in the city of Chicago. And I can use that information to make political economic decisions on, do I just fill the potholes or dig up the street? And that was where we don't listen to the questions that people need. Now they're, they're always the unknown unknowns that we all get to, you know, we live and die for, but we need to work together and help people make better decisions and recognize we're not in a world of one and done. This is gonna be a dynamic issue. Lobsters have moved from Rhode Island to Massachusetts to, no, to Maine to Nova Scotia. You know, the ecosystems move, they have this habit of changing. And so we're gonna to need to be this persistent, pervasive knowledge gathering and adaptive, ad adaptation. Thanks very much, Mark. I'm aware that we're just about at time and I'm just wondering whether um, Mark and Kathy, you'd have a few last thoughts for our audience um, before we close. Um, I'll leave you with one, and, and we've been sort of obliquely uh, touching on this or dancing around it in the last couple of questions. Um, Mark's comment about even the non-seafaring states you know, brought it back to mind. Um, and that is, in the course of the Caledon Oceanic uh, expeditions last year and this year, uh, one of the really remarkable findings uh, to me was discrete pieces, physical pieces of trash found in the bottoms of the deepest trenches on Earth. Uh, you know, the tiny percentage of the area of the ocean, but a large, actually sizable percentage of the volume. Uh, and, and even a little more worrisome to me than that was in the, the guts and the organisms that have been sampled from many of the deeps. Um, significant concentrations of microplastics, uh, again, inhaled organisms from seven, eight, 10,000, 11,000 meters depth. And I don't say that to, you know, vilify trashy humans and, and go on a screed, uh, but what it reminded me and made me think much more deeply about is those observations are a proof point that should remind us all that there is no place on this planet that is disconnected from other places. There is no part, there's no living part of this planet that is disconnected from all the other living parts of this planet. But if you, you, know, you ask someone here in Ohio where I'm sitting right now, uh, what they have to do with the Mariana's Trench, it, it seems completely out of sight, completely out of mind. It seems completely irrelevant to their life or, or untouchable by anything they could possibly be doing. But the ocean reminds us that that's wrong. It reminds us very vividly uh, how richly and completely interconnected all of Earth's systems are, including, uh, including the entire ec ecological system and our lives as well. And so I will come back to what Mark was just saying. I, I, would, I wish that engendered more richly in more of us uh, an appreciation of the importance and the obligation of stewarding this one and only one planet that we have and, the, and how vital the ocean is to any form of what we think is effective stewardship uh, of this little blue ball we live on. Thanks very much, Kathy, for that. Great, Th yeah, thanks, Kathy. That's, that's really not wonderful to hear. You know, Carol Ann Clayson's a senior scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic, and she likes to say, are we just docu documenting the decline of the ocean and we're just doing it better, <laughs> you know, by doing science in the old way? It doesn't mean we necessarily have to go out and be advocates, but it does get back to a recognition that we have to help people make better decisions and that decisions are changing as conditions and knowledge changes. Issues 50 years ago, even 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, who thought about ocean plastics? Not much, maybe a little bit in the science community. So, you know, the nature of the planets is changing. The, our interaction has changed dramatically. And so it, we really want to engender what Amy Edmondson at the Harvard Business School calls the fearless organization, an organization that is more innovative, that really we are serving a much higher purpose than just getting tenure and or promoted, uh, that we're really trying to strengthen connectivity and we're really fostering that creativity. We need the best minds, 
that we don't know where they are and where they may come from to engage in not only the journey of the wonder of going out and exploring the ocean. I mean, it is just still, you just going to sea, you find something new, but it's that participation and that knowledge that we're doing something of a higher purpose. And it is the ocean planet. And, you know, it, behind Kathy's virtual screen there, you can see a lot of cloud, but you can see in there a lot of ocean. And we need to really pay attention to that ocean. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you once again, both Mark and Kathy. And to you all, all our audience today for joining us at the first Ocean Forum. Um, we will be posting this seminar online on the OFI and COVE websites, and we'd love to hear any feedback you may have. We'll be sending up a follow-up email to everyone who's registered, and we'd love to hear your suggestions on upcoming topics. Um, as you may know, the next Ocean Forum will be on September 15th, and you just watch this space, and we'll send you more information about um, what's going to happen then. So this is the first in a regular series. And now that we'll all be off on vacation for the summer, or at least some of us will get a bit of vacation <laughs> here and there, we'll be back um, with our next event mid-September in conjunction with Dalhousie's Oceanography Department. So once again, thank you so much for a very thought-provoking discussion. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.